Sometimes I'm astounded. When I go back 100, 150 years, and I see what men of God in Great Britain and other places, but particularly Great Britain, warned of 150 years ago, what they said would become of Christianity in Britain. J.C. Ryle would be one. Charles Spurgeon, obviously, another. But not least of all was the founder of the Salvation Army, William Boop. This is what he said as we were coming to the 20th century. I consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics, government without God, and heaven without hell. Hit the nail right on the head, didn't he? And you know, Charles Spurgeon and, and J.C. Ryle, and other, they said the same things. And there were things that the Martin Lloyd-Jones said 50, 60 years ago, it's just coming exactly like what he said. Exactly. And there'll be similar things in America with, with Harry Ironside and so forth. Quite a thing. Nonetheless, when Jesus told us about these things, he didn't end on a sour note. He said, lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Now again, as we have said many times, the two things that are most outstanding about the way things have gravitated and drifted is this. One, the people who get swallowed up with it or who compromise with it, who you never thought would have. That's one thing. The second is the speed at which it's happened. The unbelievable, devastating speed at which it's happened, not just in society, but within the church. It gains momentum and will continue to do so. On the other hand, we know the Lord is preparing a people for his own name who will stand in these last days. Amen. And of all people, by his grace and by his mercy, and I don't say this to puff us up, it should be very humbling. If you see through the apostasy in the church, if you know what's wrong with the ecumenical movement and the emergent church and with the word faith, if you know what's wrong with these things, that's God's grace to you. Most people are deceived by these things. The fact that we aren't is just God's grace. It's just God's grace. Count the blessing. Count the blessing that you see it. There will always be the 7,000 who don't bow the knee to Baal. May the Lord in his grace and mercy show us the grace and mercy to be among that number. However many it may be for our time, the principle will ring just as true in the last days as it did in the days of Elijah. I've always said the ministry of Elijah comes back in some way before Christ returns. And it will be the same thing. My dear friends and brethren, it's once again my privilege and blessing to reintroduce our friend and brother from the States, Pastor Bill Randalls. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bless you that uh, you have ordained, O oh Lord, in your wisdom, that what the kings of the earth and the wise men of the earth and the counselors and the prudent and the mighty, what they don't know, what's hidden from them, is real to the babes, Lord, to the least person in any church that preaches the gospel, to the least person in any church that takes the prophecies of God seriously. The lowliest person in any church, O oh Lord, knows more about what's going on in this world, has a better perspective than all the experts, all the pundits, all the politicians, all the governors, the kings, the rulers, uh, the PhDs put together, Lord. You revealed these things to babes, and you hid these things from the wise, and you said, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent that you might be glorified, O oh Lord God. So I pray for insight tonight. 
You told us, as Jacob alluded, the faithful will be given some light. The faithful will be given insight. Oh, Lord, many of us, oh, God, uh, have fallen and gotten back up and been purified and purged again and again, Lord. And I bless you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, <clears throat> well, uh, let me just start by having you turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 2. I'm constantly referring to Psalm 2. I don't even want to be that repetitious, but I can't help it. I can't help but look at Psalm 2, and I've been doing this for years because I believe it's what God is saying, at least from uh, my perspective. Psalm 2 really speaks to our day, and he, it starts with the question, why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his Christ. Okay, now, now think about these words. These are very, very heavy, if you really think about what's being said. He says, they say, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now he that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then will he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I'll declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Did you know this is the most quoted verse in the New Testament? This passage is the most quoted passage in the New Testament. They're constantly quoting scripture, and this is the most quoted. Another one very close to it. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Psalms. People get that Psalms are worship. People get that Psalms are prayer. People get that Psalms are devotion. People get that Psalms are wisdom. But what I've been seeing lately too is that we need to get is that Psalms are prophecy. Psalms are eschatological. I mean this one for example. I, I just love this Psalm. In fact, I actually believe that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, that's the perfect way to open the book of Psalms. And if you ever think about the contrast, you know, and, and I won't go into Psalm 1 too much, but you know, it's a solitary individual. Blessed is the man who won't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who won't stand in the way of sinners or sit and seem scornful. It's a person, and he's devoted to God, and he's not listening to the times. He's not into, tuned into the wisdom of the age. He's actually separated, okay? And it talks about his inner life. I mean, what's he think about? He, you mean he doesn't listen, listen to Oprah? You mean Larry King? He's not listening to him? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Oh, by the way, you mean he doesn't have a purpose-driven life? <laughs> Look, the world has its counsel, and so does the fake church. There's never been more counsel, probably. His delight is in the word of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He's just one person. But then this Psalm 2, it goes together, but in a different way. It's a contrast. Now it's not one person. We're looking at the whole world. The whole world is in an uproar. Is that not true? Everything is turned on its head. I just, you know, like I say, one of my problems, I went to New Zealand and Australia recently, and I didn't know where to start. There's so much stuff happening at once. It's all turned on its head. The world that we once knew, we'll never see again. He's actually weaning us. You know why we have to go through what we have to go through? He doesn't want you to think you can make your home in this world. It really is the will of God that you want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to leave this world. I see now there's no permanent place for us, not in this world. Why? Is, do the heathen rage? Why are the nations in an uproar? 
The heathen are the nations. All the nations that are not Jewish are the heathen. So a heathen isn't a person that has a bone through his nose and runs around naked, okay? America's the heathen. Uh, Britain's the heathen. Swaziland's the heathen. heathen. Nigeria's the heathen. Russia's the heathen. All the non-Jewish nations are the heathen. And the heathen are in a rage. And then he, the question goes on. It's a twofold question. Why do the people imagine a vain thing? Man, I could get into that. The people are gripped by so many vain imaginations. You know, this idea that just captures people, this whole idea, uh, there's so many of them, but that you weren't created by God, evolution's a vain imagination. Or all the implications of it. I talked this morning about the creation of man and woman. What I didn't say that I should have, why is that important now? The confusion is so profound. Not only do people not know that a baby human is worth more than all the silver-backed apes in the world, it's even more profound than that. Especially the younger generation are being deliberately confused about something so primal as gender. It's a vain imagination. We are suffering from vain imaginations right and left. The kings of the earth think they can do anything they want to bring about their agenda. For example, uh, and I'm not waxing political. The reason I ever get into politics is politics is spiritual anymore. So I can't, to be a true servant of God, you've got to talk about it all. Okay, Hillary Clinton uh, boasted about undermining Libya, the richest country in Africa, and killing Gaddafi, who, of course, we all find our flaws with him. But he was so frightened and when the, the Gulf War began that he turned over voluntarily his stock of nuclear weapons and was a friend in the war on terror. But for, for complicated politics which involve Europe, especially France, Germany, and the United States, they took him out. And one of the things Gaddafi used to tell everybody is that if you ever take me out, Libya is the only country that will block black Africans in the millions from coming up into Europe. Ideas have consequences. Turns out you can't remake the world at your whim, right? Here's a vain imagination. The 1960s sexual revolution. We're going to have free love. Well, they killed love, really. I talked earlier about the tragic of marriage. They killed love. And uh, pleasure is our God. Well, one of the results of that, which uh, I think needs to be appreciated and, and, and denounced, is that uh, through abortion and birth control, not only is that a profoundly immoral and a direct affront to God who said, be fruitful and multiply, but it has left Europe the West, incapable of duplicating itself. You understand? The Germany, Italy, the, you think of Italy, you think of big, big, huge family sitting around eating spaghetti. No big family. Demographic winter. The crisis is so profound. You can get to a point where you can never come back. So, of course, like Merkel brought in a million Muslims. And she's going to bring another million Muslims. She brought in a crime wife. See, why do the people imagine a vain thing? And what is the real vain imagination? If I could get to the core of the, of the Western dream, the fantasy is that they could throw God out and still have a civil, successful, blessed society without God. This is the vain imagination. You are living the nightmare that comes from it. But he is asking a question. Two questions. Why do the heathen rage? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? And I could go into the world like, what a mess. Oh my gosh. Syria had 22 million people. The president, uh, Huff is Assad, a terrible person. I'd hate to live under him, but he never persecuted Christians. Now half of Syria can't live in Syria. That's causing another crisis in the West. 
Iraq had a population of two million Chaldean Christians. Of course, they weren't Christians like you and I understand Christians, but they were Christians and they did confess the name of Christ and they did live through the dark uh, demi status that's imposed on them. Saddam Hussein never persecuted Christians, but when we removed him and our soldiers fought, bled, and died so that they could establish Sharia law. You know how many uh, Chaldean Christians, a, a population that was there from the time of Christ until today, you know how many are left in Iraq? Less than 200,000. You know what that's called? Genocide. Do you know Libya used to be the richest country in Africa? I read an article, what the Libyans lost when the West took out Gaddafi. Oh, every citizen in Libya, I mean, whatever you think about Gaddafi, you know, I don't like him either, but every citizen got a check from the oil revenues. Every citizen was guaranteed a full education. Every citizen was guaranteed free health care. Libya is a terror state of nightmare proportions now because the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, especially the ruling elite. And yet he answers the question, and the answer is hard medicine to take. Here's the reason why the world's in an uproar, and here's the reason why all the people are in the grip of a, a vain imagination. Why? It has to do with the kings of the earth and their rulers. Now let me stop here. The kings of the earth and their rulers are not political leaders only. It's not a reference just to kings, prime ministers, presidents. The kings of the earth and their rulers has to do with what we call in the US the ruling elite. The ones that shape opinion, the ones that educate on the highest level, the ones that control entertainment, the ones that control information, the ones that control news, the ones that control, yes, government, even the ones in control of organized religion. I don't trust organized religion, that's why I try to run a disorganized church. Okay. <laughs> he, but this is an answer. This is the Holy Spirit. This is a prophecy. Why do the heathen rage people imagine anything? Oh, well, the kings of the earth and their rulers have taken counsel together. Really? Yeah, against the Lord and his Christ. Notice the specificity. It's not just against religion. No, only one religion. The religion of Yahweh and Mashiach. They take their counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. So this is where? Is it in the basement of the Bilderberg Hotel? Is that it? There's not enough room in the basement of the Bilderberg Hotel. And besides that, there's not enough time in any one uh, conference to take the kind of counsel he's talking about here. I think I understand the meaning of this verse by revelation and by uh, experience. In fact, it's one of the oldest stories in the book, if you ask me. Tell me if this relates. Well, you don't have to tell me out loud, just in your heart, all right? If you can relate to this. You want your kids to do better, so you scrimp and save, so you can send them to higher education. And then you're appalled by the end of the first semester they're green. They're judging you for using too much trash, okay? Then by the end of the second semester, lo and behold, they're pro-gay. And you're going, where's my son? Where's my daughter? What happened to her? By the end of the first year, they hate capitalism. What? <laughs> and if their education's complete, they'll be green, pro-gay, hate capitalism. And to be specific, hate Israel with all of their being. This is where they take the counsel. And this is where it's been taken for 80 to 100 years. And this is where there's this amazing consensus among, unless you're very resistant. I sent my son to law school, but I just pray every day and told him, you got to pass these classes, but you shouldn't accept this philosophy. This is evil. What's happening is evil. And it's being manifest. Almost every single institution that we once 
relied on for stability and order in society, if you think about it, is increasingly being revealed as antichrist. Even good ones, like medicine. For example, in the US, medicine could mean a great world-class medical system. You could mean the latest techniques to fight cancer. Could mean gender reassignment surgery for an eight-year-old boy. This is a nightmare. Could mean abortion. Could mean partial birth abortion. Law. Law. Law used to be, you know, fixed principles. Justice is blind. Rule by law. Rex Lex. Not uh, Lex Rex. You know what I'm saying? Law is king. Not the king is law. But you ought to see what they're doing with the law in the U.S. It's unbelievable. Education, oh my gosh. Religion, organized religion, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. Now let me go further. Uh, see, evidently, what this uh, council amounts to is a liberation movement from the Lord and his Christ. That's what it says. They say, the council they take says, let us cast aside their bands. Let's take, let's throw their bands asunder. Who, who's there? The Lord and his Christ. What bands? Well, the religion of the Lord and his Christ. The ethics of the Lord and his Christ. The Ten Commandments of the Lord and his Christ. They're saying, who says marriage has to be between a man and a woman? Why can't we redefine it? And they throw one band off another. You know what the problem nowadays is? They're running out of stuff to destroy. They destroyed it all. It's harder and harder for people to be shocking anymore. I mean, where do you go after transgender? Let us cast aside their cords. Christianity is bondage. The Judeo-Christian civilization, bondage. Too many rules, too many restrictions, too much inhibition. Throw it all off. And they're going to set people free. But the problem is, you know, they're going to set people free of what? Well, people are free of marriage now. And people are free of commitment. And people are free of love. And people are free of romance. This is one band and bond after another. Snap, snap. Snap, free of truth? We got a generation free of truth. You know who the freest person in that sense in the whole Bible is? A man who would not be bound by anybody, who would not put on any convention. How far did he go? He wouldn't even wear clothes. And where do we find him in the Bible? It's where we find a lot of this generation. He's crying day and night. His freedom is the freedom of someone that's out in space. And they get this feeling, man, there's no limits. Oh, wait, no, there is one limit. I got this cord that attaches me to the spaceship. I'm not totally free. So they bring out their space scissors. Clip, I'm free. But free of what? Free of air. Free of life. Free of sanity. Well, the Bible says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. I think we're coming into that now. One of the things that's fascinating to me, like I said earlier, WikiLeaks, the kings of the earth and the rulers and their plans and their plots and the pit that they're digging for people are now exposed for everybody to see. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Now, what I really want to get into is um, a subject about prophecy that has everything to do with this psalm. And that is this, okay, when I was a kid, uh, my father was, uh, had a, a, a gift. He was an oil painter, an artist. And, you know, he didn't have much, and we had like 10 kids in this little house, and so we just about drove him crazy. But every once in a while, I mean, his idea of relaxation, I could see this to this point, is uh, if you got up to go to the bathroom or something at 2 in the morning, you walk by his study, He'd be sitting there with his back to you. He'd be smoking a pipe, and he had a big easel. And he'd take a paint, and his oil paints, he'd go, chh, 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 this color, and then chh, chh, chh. 
And you look and you go, what's he painting? I don't see anything except a little blotch here, a little blotch there, a little blotch here, a little blotch there. And he would do like 67 coats. And gradually, all of a sudden, it emerged. You could see clearly what he was painting. That's the way it is, in my experience, of 30 plus years of looking at the prophecies of the Bible. I didn't know what I was seeing. I didn't know what was going on. But now, all of a sudden, it's getting clear. It's a wonderful clarity. Or it's like paint by numbers. Anyone did paint by numbers? You think, this doesn't look like anything. This is embarrassing. I don't even want anyone to see it. Well, just keep going, keep going. Get those numbers right. That's cool. This, the Bible prophecies feature uh, so many different aspects. And yet, I've never seen a time like now where they're all coming into play. I'm going to talk about one of them. Oh, you got, you got Israel, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. I talk about it all the time. You can't, you can't even begin to understand Bible prophecy unless you factor in Israel. This is why people with replacement theology could not understand what's going on. And I don't know about you, but I think that's a serious disability to have. I want to know what's going on, OK? Might not be able to do anything about it, but I want to know what's going on, all right? We could pray. Uh, you got these figures like the Pope, the Muslim world, all of the biblical nations are back in play. You know, all the biblical nations, which were almost nothing 30 or 40 years ago. Who cared about Persia? Who cared about Iran? Who cared about Iraq? Who cared about Syria? Who cared about Egypt? They just didn't count for anything. Then when Israel became a nation, all of a sudden all these other nations come back into play. And now the biblical nations are dominating the headlines, right? Jesus is coming. Amen? And the one I want to really point out tonight is uh, a figure that a lot of people don't really often relate to Bible prophecy, but I think it's a very strong thing, very heavily prophesied. Part of Psalm 2 is a prophecy of this, and that is the United Nations. The United Nations is a very, very much prophesied and anticipated organization. I mean, even this psalm here, the kings of the earth, there has never been in history until 1945, right after World War II, never before in human history has there been literally a congress of all the nations of the earth. All the nations of the earth now meet on a regular basis in congress and they vote and deliberate and decide and argue and, 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 and plot um, the whole state of the world. But about a third of their time or even more is centered on a little postage stamp country called Israel. The United Nations is definitely, definitely in the Bible. Let me show you another place where it's in the Bible. Zechariah 12. See, someone asked me one time, is the United States in Bible prophecy? I said, absolutely, of course it is. Oh, really, where? And I just showed him this verse, the verse I'm going to show you in Joel, where it says, all nations, all nations. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens, and lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, I often speak about this. I have a chapter about it in my book, um, Wait, uh, The Sword on the Land. This is a big, pivotal prophecy and one of the most stunningly clear prophecies that we're seeing with our very eyes right now. So I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but... Uh, I do want you to point in verse 3. In that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All the people. And all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Like I say, there's never been a time in history until now. Post-1945. When you could literally say, all the people of the earth? Are you saying all the people of the earth? 
all the people of the earth shall marshal themselves and gather together. It's a heavy stone, Jerusalem. I, I mentioned earlier UNESCO's renaming of Jerusalem <laughs> and uh, assigning it to the Muslims. It's a Muslim shrine now, I guess. The Holy Temple Mount is a Muslim shrine. And uh, this is ridiculous. It's absurd. It's a nightmare. But it's also a sign that the inmates are running the asylum. Okay, <laughs> seriously. But well, you've got to be crazy. You've got to be crazy to say what they're saying. That's a Muslim shrine. Jerusalem's mentioned in the Bible more than 800 times. Jerusalem is never mentioned once in the Quran. The Jerusalem is the Jews' holiest site. The Temple Mount is the holiest site to Israel. The Temple Mount is considered the third holiest site to Islam. Although Jerusalem's never mentioned in the Quran. The, the modern Muslim scholars do say there is one verse in the Quran that refers to Jerusalem, and it's the Isra. And since I know you guys are up on your crayon, you probably know the Isra. I'll just keep moving, okay? <laughs> oh, you want me to tell you what it is? Yeah. All right. The Isra is where Muhammad got on a winged horse from Mecca and flew to Al-Aqsa. And anyone ever that, heard that? Yeah. Al-Aqsa is the farthest place. And there he ascended to heaven, as you all know, and had a Muslim prayer meeting with Jesus, Moses, and Abraham. That's the Isra, okay. And that is the verse, the one verse in the Quran that one out of seven people in the world claim that Jerusalem is our holy city, our holy site, and this is our claim to it. Now, I will tell you something interesting. I mean, there's so much going on that it's, uh, some things are soon forgotten of great significance. When our president... Obama took office, he did something in the first year of his reign that, um, yes, it's a reign. <laughs> used to serve, but now it's a reign. Anyway, uh, he did something unprecedented for a U.S. president. He gave a speech to the whole Muslim world. That's one out of seven people. Didn't do it from Washington, he did it in Cairo. And one of the things, that preconditions for giving that speech, and, and Mubarak really mis underestimated Obama. He said, I won't do it in Cairo. I won't give you this privilege unless you legitimize a group called the Ikhwan. And I know you know what that is. So, Oh, you don't? The Muslim Brotherhood. In other words, the father of world terrorism jihad today. And they were banned in Egypt. It's incredible. They're not banned in America. They're banned in Egypt. People that know Islam the best ban the Ikhwan. Okay. But Obama got Mubarak to legitimize them. And when he gave this speech to the whole Muslim world, he had the Muslim Brotherhood sitting in a place of prominence. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all of the details and the manifold lies of the speech, but I do want to make one point. When a politician talks to a group of people, usually they try to relate to them. Like if you're going to talk to Christians, you, know, you might want to quote a verse, you know, uh, like uh, Trump said, two Corinthians or something, all right? <laughs> Just to show you one of them. Well, Obama quoted one verse from the Quran. And guess what it was? The Isra. You understand the meaning of that? The leader of the so-called free world, and that one time most powerful, humanly speaking, nation on earth, addressed the Muslim world and legitimized their one claim to the city where our Lord was crucified, where God raised him from the dead, where the Jewish holy temple was. He said, no. Oh, he quoted the Isra. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy weight, a cup of trembling. And so he says, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, this is what we're seeing with our eyes today. All the people of the earth. I tell you something, last September, there was the 70th General Assembly of the UN. And man, it was an amazing thing if you had eyes to see. Everyone who's anyone was there. Let me just give you a little a rundown of this. The Pope addressed the UN. Now listen to this. The, I won't bore you with the speech the Pope made, but I will give you his greeting because I think it's very significant if you know what you're talking about. He said, I greet you. I come in my own name. 
and the name of the Catholic Church. See, some of you know what that means. I mean, in the first place, that's an odd saying. Whoever says, I come in my own name, okay, what's that mean? I never heard it before. There's only one other person I ever heard use that expression, Jesus, when he warned Israel. But I come to you in the name of God, and you won't receive me. Another will come to you in his own name. You will receive him. But I don't, I don't believe the Pope's the Antichrist, but I do believe he has the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, the Pope, uh, at that same time, raised the Palestinian flag with that champion of freedom and human rights, Mahmoud Abbas, <laughs> the planner of the 1972 slaughter of the Olympics, received with great acclaim at the UN. The man who that very week tried to incite what he called the knife jihad, which is spreading around the world, said, we welcome every drop of blood shed in Jerusalem. And he was received by the UN, great acclaim. It was also incredible because you have uh, Vladimir Putin. I mean, people don't even realize what's passing before their eyes. Ever since World War I and the outcome of it, Middle East was under the control of the West. Britain, France, and the US. The US, Britain, France, hegemony, divided up the Middle East, a, a Middle Eastern order, shaky by most people's uh, reckoning, but way better than what we have now, okay. Obama basically turned our influence over to Vladimir Putin and allowed him to take over for the so-called role of policeman or whatever. Vladimir Putin, KGB agent. Vladimir Putin got it up before the UN and basically chastised us, and rightly so. You created uh, ISIS. And he said, you have destabilized Syria. You have destroyed Libya. You have destroyed the order in the Middle East. And millions of people are suffering for it. Oh, Syria? Syria had 22 million people. Half of them can't live there anymore. It's a nightmare. Christians used to be able to live unmolested there. OK. Uh, a vain imagination, right? We're going to make everything better. They're making a nightmare. Libya, nightmare. Uh, I could go on and on about this uh, 70th General Assembly, but one of the most amazing and gripping, compelling parts of it was when Benjamin Netanyahu stood up. And many people walked out, in, unfortunately, including the US delegation. And he sat there and uh, basically castigated the world for sitting idly by, uh, especially the US, while the President of the United States made a deal with Iran, a country that said at the beginning of the negotiations, the utter destruction of uh, Israel is not even negotiable. This is what we're going to do. US government said, all right, let's talk. Let's make a deal. By the time that deal was done, the sponsor, the leading sponsor of world terrorism, the undisputed, uncontested exporter of terror to the ends of the earth ever since 1979 when Carter gave Iran to the savages, was given 150 billion US dollars. Now through WikiLeaks and other sources, we find out that Obama secretly sent them three billion in cash. You know why they have to send them cash? Because that's how you pay terrorists, in cash. And then adding insult to injury, they said, we don't trust the dollar. Can you get this in Swedish kroner and others? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> this is a nightmare. You know, the biggest voting bloc at the UN is the Organization of Islamic Conference. They, uh, they have 57 states. Islamic states, and they vote as a bloc. Okay, that's why <laughs> some of the statistics from the UN. Now, let me bore you just for a few minutes with statistics, okay? Uh, 
this is from Dave Hunt, so this is a few years ago, more than 600,000, no, more than 60,000 individual co votes have been cast in the UN condemning Israel. <laughs> the, only, the only democracy in the Middle East, a place where any Arab has better, a better life than in any Arab country. Uh, yet not once has the UN reprimanded those who have without propagation waged four wars of aggression against Israel with the declared intention of annihilating her. Nor have the terrorists been condemned by the UN. Oh, the UN Council on uh, Women's, uh, something like Women's Human Rights, declared Israel the, leading, the world's leading violator of human rights for women. Not Saudi Arabia, not Burqa land, not honor killing land, not genital mutilation land, oh, those are fine. Israel, I'm telling you something and I'm not even trying to be funny. The crazies are running the asylum. This is the kings of the earth and the rulers. He says, Israel in, in introduced its, in November 2003, Israel introduced its first request for a resolution since 1976, asking for a prohibition against Arab terrorists who deliberately target Israeli women and children. Its request was rejected. And instead, the UN adopted a resolution demanding protection of Palestinian children from Israeli aggression. On and on, I mean, it. I could go on and on. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I don't like too much statistics, so I think you get the point. The UN is a major player in the last days. The UN is described every time in the Bible, it says, of bring all nations, all nations. This UNESCO, this vote to make Jerusalem, you know, the Holy Temple Mount, uh, a Muslim shrine, uh, as I said earlier, they already made the tomb of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when, when you think Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I mean, something Jewish comes to mind, okay? I never think Muslim, but they said, no, that's a Muslim shrine. Tomb of, uh, tomb of Leah, tomb of Sarah. Poor Rachel didn't die and was, wasn't able to be buried with the patriarchs. They buried her in a separate tomb. UNESCO did not want to leave Rachel out, the mother of Joseph Benjamin, and declared the tomb of Rachel a Muslim shrine. This is madness. But this goes beyond madness. This is satanic. Satan is working. Satan desires to have the world. They may sift it like wheat. Satan is lying. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, take you to another scripture, and then maybe, you know, we can. It's Joel chapter 3. The UN and Israel. 1974, the UN invited Yasser Arafat to address the General Assembly, a man who could hardly scrub the blood off his hands. He was greeted with great applause and treated as a world leader, the father of modern day terrorism. Uh, the, uh, in 1975, the UN created a permanent representative status to the Palestinian Liberation Organization first terror group. By the way, God says, as you've done to them, I will do to you. I remember when uh, Islamic terror was their problem. You do too, because it's in your lifetime. There was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, that none of us had anything to do and were nowhere near Islamic terror. Islamic terror was there. It was against Israel. It was against them. And we all had a lot of advice to tell them how to deal with it. Why don't you work with these fine people? Give them land. It's a nightmare. Uh, 1991, General Assembly called for a UN-sponsored peace conference that would include the PLO. It was voted for 142. Same day, they voted 142 to two to condemn Israeli behavior toward the Palestinians. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, in 1991, 152 to one vote to call on Israel to rescind its declaration that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. By the way, this is current news too. Jerusalem, obviously, is the capital of Israel, right? And let me say a few words about Jerusalem before I go on. And I told you I wasn't going to give you rocket science. I'm going to tell you what you already know, but you need to hear again. Jerusalem's the most important city on earth. 
okay? It's the most important city on earth. Biblically, you know, great is the Lord, right? And greatly to be praised is the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. What? Of the great king. Jerusalem's the city of the great king. What king? King Messiah. Jesus quoted that verse. Did you know that? In the Sermon on the Mount? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus quoted that Psalm 48. He said, don't swear at all, neither by heaven for it's God's throne, nor by earth for it's God's footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem. Why? It's the city of the great king. Oh, the king's coming back. I can take you to Zechariah 14, where it tells you the king will come back and set his feet right on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is coming back right there. The coming of Jesus is real. Amen? Why is Jerusalem the most important city on earth? Well, I don't even know what this means in its entirety. But the Bible says it's the only city on earth where God has put his name forever. Let me tell you what happened in the U.S. last year that I found of great interest. A young American citizen who happened to be Jewish applied for a passport. And at the office, they say, where were you born? And he said, I was born in Jerusalem, Israel. And they said, you can't get a passport because Jerusalem's not in Israel. <laughs> OK. Now, he did what any red-blooded American would do. He sued. OK. He took him to court. And he lost. But then he appealed to a higher court. Can't I say I was born in Jerusalem, Israel? I was born in Jerusalem, Israel. Jerusalem's in Israel. The higher court said, no, Jerusalem's not in Israel. You can't say Jerusalem's in Israel. He took it to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, we got a lot of problems and a lot of people claiming things and a lot of serious issues to resolve. But the Supreme Court said, no, we got to take that case. That's important to us. Why would it be important to them? This is spiritual. The Supreme Court of the United States said, you cannot say, you were born in Jerusalem, Israel. You can't get a passport that says you were born in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not in Israel. Now, Obama just recently spoke at the funeral of Shimon Peres. This is the same thing. The White House published a leaflet announcing his speech. And they made a big mistake. You know what the big mistake was? They said Obama will be addressing the crowd in Jerusalem, Israel. <laughs> but someone caught it. Now, listen to this. Someone caught it. So instead of coming up with a new one that blacked it out, they just put a line through Israel and released it. That's not even professional. That's going out of your way to make a point. Look what Zechariah said. I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. You can't believe the trembling coming over that. I'll make Jerusalem a huge, heavy stone on the road. Whenever I read that verse, I think of the kings of the earth all happily walking down the yellow brick road. Does anyone know what the yellow brick road is? <laughs> and they just feel just around the corner what we want. We'll get through peace, through love, through listening to John Lennon's song, Imagine, through technology? What is it that they want? They want a world utopia without God. They want to X out the Lord and his Christ. Isn't that what the psalm says? It's just around the corner. But wait a minute. There's a big rock in the road. Now I'll just pick on my own country. Uncle Sam says, I'm a problem solver. I'll roll up my sleeves, and I'll just pick up this rock and move it out of the way, and on we'll go. Only Zechariah says, whoever tries to pick that stone up, what it literally says is, we'll be lacerated. You know what lacerated means? Cut to the bone. On my blog, which I'm not giving a plug for a blog, but it's billrandles.wordpress.com. Well, anyway, <laughs> I have an article, The Laceration of Two Presidencies. Two U.S. presidents that were on their way to the pantheon of great presidents until they tried to pick that stone up. And both ended in utter humiliation and as pariahs. See? 
the UN is definitely a member and a player in the end time scenario. Go to Joel 3. Did I already have you turn to Joel 3? Did anyone by chance turn to Joel 4? Now, I'm not trying to be cute. I promise I'm not. He probably did, because he probably has a Hebrew version of the Bible. The reason I say this is one day, I saw an article. I wish I would have brought it with me, but I'm such a mess. I, do, I just fumbling through these papers, all right. An, an article from R.H. Sheva magazine. So it's not a Christian magazine. And it said, um, Sanhedrin to the UN. Uh, the Goldstone Report, this is all the headline, will bring about the horrors of Joel 4. And I looked at that headline and I thought, what? <laughs> so much, so weird, so unexpected. In the first place, did they say the Sanhedrin? Well, the Sanhedrin, that's the Senate of Israel. The very Senate of Israel that put Jesus Christ on trial. The very Senate of Israel that basically disappeared in the second century sometime and was never seen again until about five years ago. Sanhedrin's back. They just did a very interesting thing recently. I won't go into the detail. They just appointed a high priest. You know how close we are? And then the headline says, Sanhedrin to the UN. What? Yes, they write to the UN in the name of the God of Israel and the God of Scripture. Well, what were they writing to the UN about? Well, there was a judge, a South African judge named Goldstone, who was assigned by the UN to make a report about the, Israel, the war with Hezbollah in 2006. His report was so slanted, so biased, even by Jewish standards, so ugly, so calumnous, that the Sanhedrin fired off a letter to the UN and said, we are warning you in the name of the God of the Bible, if you don't back off of that report, now they're not threatening. They're saying, you're going to bring on the world the horrors of Joel chapter 4. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. Something doesn't sound right. I opened up my Bible. There is no Joel 4. <laughs> but then I found out that the Jews divide it differently. Joel 2, 26 through 29 is their Joel 3. Joel 3 is Joel 4. Let me show you the UN in the Bible, and then I'll close, okay? Joel chapter 3. For behold in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. You mind if I cassette this? To you young people who have no idea what I'm talking about when I say cassette, there used to be a relic a long time ago, almost like scrolls in a little plastic thing. <laughs> we called them tape cassettes. I know, it's hard to believe. But they did have advantages over C CDs. You could stop and rewind. That's what I mean by I want to cassette this. But I had to explain to the kids, you know. Behold, in that day and that time, oh, he's going to give us a time. When I again restore the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, stop the tape. 1948. But I do want to say something about this too. Notice he said Judah and Jerusalem. Almost as you wouldn't think you'd need to delineate. But Joel had no way of knowing that in the last days before the world body Jerusalem would be one major problem, the biggest, but right after it, Judah, or Judea. Only they don't say Judea, so you wouldn't know, unless you know, the West Bank, the occupied territories, the settlers. But Joel saw it. We're going to bring him back to Jerusalem. We're going to bring him back into Judea. Oh, before I go on, though, the definitive chapter of the Bible from Jesus about the last days is Matthew 24. I gave you the setting for it, this first session. 
Matthew 24, the background setting for Matthew 24. Now, the thing about Matthew 24 is they ask the signs and everything, and he starts talking about earthquakes, wars, calamities, false prophets, deception. I mean, you name it. He gives a list of signs. But the thing about all those signs that he says is all of them are universal. Earthquakes, where? Everywhere. False prophets, where? Everywhere. False Christ, where? Everywhere. Famines, where? Everywhere. Wars, where? Everywhere. All of a sudden, in verse 15, he gets local. Then... Let them which be in Judea. Judea is the contested land that the world hates the fact the Jewish settlers are building housing there. The heart of biblical Israel. They say, no, that's Palestine. That's the occupied territory. That's the West Bank. Something so bad is going to come over that conflict. Something so awful is going to break out over it that Jesus himself looks up from the pages of the Bible and talks to settlers in Judea who most probably don't even believe in him and tells them, when you see the desecration from the book of Daniel happen, if you live in Judea, don't even go back in your house when you see this to get your coat. Get out of there. Run for your life. If you're pregnant, pray that you're not pregnant. Pray that it's not winter. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath when everything's closed. He says, something happens so horrible out of Judea that then shall come great tribulation such as the world has never seen before and will never see again. Now let me go back to Joel 3. He says in Joel chapter 3, verse 2, I will gather all nations... Well, there's the UN. All the nations are going to be gathered. Well, he is gathering all nations. They meet every, every day in New York City. I wish they'd lived to move to Botswana or something, but they're there in New York City. I'll gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Oh, the prophet's vision is so clear here. There's nothing left to doubt. Jehoshaphat, a threefold understanding of this. Number one, there is a valley of Jehoshaphat. Number two, you're supposed to realize what the name Jehoshaphat means. What does the name of the king Jehoshaphat mean? Yahweh shall judge. And number three, I believe that you're supposed to remember the story of Jehoshaphat. What is it? Oh, that Jerusalem was the last readout of biblical faith. And a sea of paganism surrounded them. It was so bad. They were so sure they were about ready to be wiped out. But good King Jehoshaphat called a prayer meeting in the Holy Temple. And they were dynamic because they had the spirit, the gifts of the spirit. And someone gave a prophecy. Remember that? And told them, go take the praisers and put them out in front and go attack the enemy. That took a lot of faith. He says, if you believe, you'll prosper. And they went out, and before they could even get to the enemy, the enemy fell on each other. And a great victory was wrought. I'll bring all nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now let me read on just a few more minutes, okay? He says, um, and I will plead with them there. You've got to be careful with biblical language that you don't impute modern meanings to it. So I stopped the tape again. I will plead with them there. We think plead with them, that means he's got his hat in his hand. You're going, would you go easy on Israel for me? No, this is legal, technical language. The holy God is saying, I'm bringing all nations down to the valley of God shall judge, and I'm going to put a lawsuit on you, a four-count lawsuit. You have charges leveled against you by the judge of the whole world. Four of them. Really? What's the first one? See how modern this is. He says, because you scattered my heritage Israel among the nations. Well, someone says, well, that, that was like 539 B.C. No, it's been going on ever since. Okay. Look, George Bush Jr. and Ariel Sharon dislodge 
Jews living in the Gaza, land gave, God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The very week that they did that, Eros Sharon went into a coma, and he never came out of it. He died eight years later. And George Bush Jr.'s presidency was destroyed by something called Hurricane Katrina. They're still scattering. I think of the ship Exodus. What happened after the Holocaust? Jews wanted to come back to the Holy Land. The British Navy rammed a ship full of them called the Exodus, turned them away, and then to humiliate them further, interned them in a camp. You know where? Germany. Defeated Nazi Germany. You can just go wait in Germany. <laughs> yeah, they scattered them. I could give you example after example after example. Have you ever heard of the St. Louis? This is in the height of the Holocaust. Jews uh, chartered a ship, 701 to escape. They got on the ship and took it to Cuba. Cuba wouldn't let them disbark unless they each paid a million dollars. Okay, so they gouged it. They couldn't do it. They went to every harbor up in, in America that they could. But they were turned away at every one of them. They went back to France. This is occupied France. They disembarked. As far as anyone knows, most of them died in the Holocaust. You don't think God takes names? You don't think God keeps a record? He says, I'm going to bring a lawsuit against you because of my people, Israel, whom you have scattered among the nations. Now, here's an ironic thing. Okay, I'll give you two ironic things. Everything with God is ironic. All right? Europe... The continental Europe did not want the Jews. J Jews in France were saying, this feels like 1938. Okay. They don't want the Jews. So what do they get? Millions of Muslims. I don't know about you, but I'd take the Jews. Millions of them. This is divine judgment. You know, divine judgment's happening. I thought, who, Merkel's got to be out of her mind. Well, all of the leaders of the nation are out of their mind. He says, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. You know what that means? You go out of your mind. It's a judgment where God makes you drink it, and you lose your mind. You go crazy. Um, another irony. A lot of places in the world, you know, especially on college, university campuses, it's just, this is where stupidity lives, okay? And they have these people all hyped up on Palestinian propaganda, and they form these BDS groups, uh, boycott, divest, and uh, what is it? Sanction. So, and then they go into the grocery stores and they say, "Is this grown in Judea by Jews? Fine, well then mark it so that we can't, we won't buy it. You got to mark it so we won't buy it. And so you get your food marked. Okay. So, people get into that for a while, and then all of a sudden you go to buy meat at the supermarket or the co-op, or whatever, right? And you look, what is that Arabic writing? Oh, it's halal. Goody, we get to eat meat sacrificed to Satan. This is a judgment. Who voted on halal? Did you vote that meat would be marked halal? Did anyone ask you, hey, we, for our business, we want to have an Islamic priest pray to the devil and sanctify your meat for Satan? I never voted for that, did you? Now, let me go to the second charge. He says, I will, they also parted my land. <laughs> the whole thing of Gaza, the whole thing of Judea and Samaria that they call the West, this is the kings of the earth and their rulers. They decided, okay, originally the, the, the Valford Declaration gave not only what we call Israel, but Jordan too. <laughs> That's part of the Holy Land. But then to appease the Arabs, they cut off three quarters of it, gave it to uh, the direct descendants of Muhammad, by the way, the Hashemite dynasty of Jordan, direct descendants of Muhammad. So God saw this. You know, the Jews themselves would like to part the land, but they can't because God says, the land is mine. The land is mine. Number three, the charge that comes against them. They've cast lots for my people. Now, I'll give you the modern meaning of this. What does it mean to cast lots? It means to dare, to sit in vote and decide 
the fate, which is about one third of the time of the satanic organization, the UN, is spent. Long deliberations. What's the borders of Israel? How many Jews should we allow to live in the West Bank? How many buildings can you build for people in Jerusalem? What is the status of Jerusalem? Okay, I, I, I could just go on and on and on. They, God sees this and it's an affront to him. This is the third count of the indictment that's going to bring judgment on the whole world. And the last one, for a boy, they uh, sold a boy for a harlot and a girl for wine. Well, let me try to explain this briefly before I close. Uh, a boy and a girl speaks of innocence. The innocent. Okay. A harlot is like the opposite of innocence, right? What does a harlot do? You take something precious and sell it. Why? Because you want something. So you sell your virtue. Okay. And some people are reduced to like drug addicts and stuff. Sell their virtue, just get high or get drunk. I mean, this is harlotry, right? And he says to the whole nation of the world, you sell out the innocent. You sell out your virtue because you're so thirsty for wine, the harlot and the wine. Okay, if John saw a vision of a harlot drunk, okay, the wine of her fornication, the wine of her adultery, drunk on the blood of the saints, selling the innocent. What is the meaning of it? Well, let me just close by saying, you know, the U.S. itself, I'll just pick up my own nation, we have these very, very high standards on human rights. That's the big buzzword, human rights, human rights. And we, um, even at the height of the Cold War with the Russian army, had, had their missiles pointed at us, we'd preach human rights and preach human rights to the Chinese and preach human rights to everybody. Everything was human rights. And we'd call them on their uh, way they treated people every single time. But when... Uh, Palestinian terrorists blew up pizza parlors or school buses or kidnapped a little boy or a little girl. We didn't have anything to say. Why? See, I, I like to say this in closing. I think God has presented to the nations of the world a moral test in this. He knew that in the last days, highly technological world, that we would depend on oil. Now that's going away, by the way. The Arabs' days are numbered. But for a long time, you've got to appease the Arabs. You've got to keep the oil cheap. You've got to keep the oil flowing. So look the other way at terrorism. Look the other way. Do you think God didn't see that? I'm going to bring all nations down to the valley of God shall judge, and I'm going to put a lawsuit on them because of these four counts. And he goes on to say in the next verse, you know, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? This is my last point. I wrote a book back there after um, the Arab Spring because even though there's a lot of optimism in the U U.S., this is great. Democracy's come to the Muslim world. Those of us that know, we realize this is something different. It is great, though. It's the positioning of all the nations for the final outcome and for the coming of our Savior. Amen. And one of the things I did to try to help people understand, I really wanted to write a very understandable book. I am not a scholar or an academic. I just put it right down there. And what I did is I took the ancient names for the nations and upgraded them. I mean, how many times have you sat there and read the Bible, if you've read the Bible for any amount of time, you read verses, this, and Edom shall do this and that and the other, and you think, Edom, Edom. Oh, yeah, they went out of existence a long time ago. Keep reading. Tyre and Sidon. Oh, yeah, Alexander the Great destroyed those. Keep reading. And you got all these, you just keep going. But why are these names in end times prophecy then? Tyre and Sidon? Tyre and Sidon, who's that? Southern Lebanon. Do you remember any of that were alive in the 70s? What happened to Lebanon? The only Christian country in the Middle East literally dissected for the whole world to sit back and watch and say nothing. 
a nightmare. We didn't even think about it. And what happened? It was the only Christian country in the Middle East until the jihad came. And just what you're seeing now everywhere else. Muslims from all over the world taking time off to come in and live the life of jihad and Muhammad. Rape, pillage, and slaughter. And they drove the Christians into southern Lebanon. And there was a last readout of Christians in southern Lebanon. And Israel actually invaded Lebanon in 1982. Does anyone remember that? And they held Lebanon. They were going after Yasser Arafat. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was 23 years old. I'm watching the news. And I see they got Beirut surrounded. And I think, yeah, get him, get him. Don't hold back. Get him. Get Yasser Arafat and his sewer rats. I'm sorry. I'm trying to be politically correct, but it's really hard. <laughs> And then uh, the UN made them stand down. And I could still that sh see that ship headed for Tunisia with Yasser and his gang who lived to kill a lot more people. And Israel held southern Lebanon and were a buffer for the Christians there for 18 years. But then what happened? Well, like anything, you can't hold hostile land forever without paying a lot of money and losing a lot of blood. So they actually said, we, we can't do this indefinitely. And they told the Christians, you've got to find other arrangements because we're going to back out. And they left in the year 2000. And a group came in behind them perfectly timed. It made them rock stars in the Muslim world because they made it look like they pushed Israel out, called Hezbollah. Now, what did Hezbollah do ever since then? Amass rockets so that with impunity, they could shower them on Israel, which is something they've done in the tens of thousands. It's a miracle. They're so, such failures. They haven't killed as many people as they wanted. Then the Gaza was vacated. And when the Jews were leaving Gaza, many of them with tears in their eyes being dragged out by the IDF. And many of them had businesses, greenhouses. And they're very successful. And they said, look, if we can't have them in generosity, we'll just bequeath them to you. Make something of your life, you poor Palestinians, please. But they were barely over the border when you could hear the glass breaking because they weren't into making something of their life. They were into setting up launching pads so that southern Lebanon could supply them with rockets. Now, in closing, look at this verse and realize the setting. The last days, the UN, all the things we've been talking about. He says, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine, southern Lebanon, and the Gaza, the most high addresses? You going to get revengeance on me? You going to render me a recompense? It's frightening. He goes on to say, look, every nation, gird yourself for war. You know what the world's favorite verse is? Outside the UN, there's a park. And in the park, there's a wall. And on the wall is the world's favorite Bible verse. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Right? But in Joel 3, God inverts the verse. You can't invert it, and I can't invert it, but God can. What's he say to the nations of the world? Get ready for war. Turn your plowshares back into swords. Turn your tractors into tanks. Gird yourself and come on down. Let's fight. It's actually frightening. What you're seeing is the fulfillment of Joel 3. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you.